The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. Good morning. The Lord is risen. Let's look to him in prayer. Our God and our Father, we thank Thee for the risen Christ, Thy beloved Son. Thank Thee for what He did at the cross of Calvary, glorifying Thee. And in so doing, He has saved our soul, being a sacrifice for sins. Hallelujah. Help us now as we open Your Word. Make it alive to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. David the Shepherd King, we've entitled this, The Exceedingly Erring Fool. In our last lesson, we saw that the Ziphites had yet again betrayed David's location to Saul and that Saul had yet again yielded to the temptation to rise up against David. What a powerful reminder that the carnal and hateful sinful nature does not change. And Saul's nature, apart from new birth, will be fixed for eternity and will never change. But through new birth, the believer has two natures. All believers are partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 2, 4, and all believers still possess the sinful, edemic nature, the flesh, Romans 7, 17, and 18. And which nature we follow is a choice we make moment by moment. In other words, a believer can behave like Christ or a believer can behave like Saul. For instance, the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, Luke 23, 20, uh, 23 34. But Saul had hate in his heart and sought to kill David. How many times believers have professed to have forgiven someone, only later to yield to the temptation of anger, resentment, and bitterness against that same person? This is simply not to be. And a believer who is harboring unforgiveness is not following Christ, but Saul. Saul had earlier professed reconciliation with David. He had acknowledged that David was more righteous and more merciful than he. He had confessed that David would be the king of Israel, even charging David to vow that he would not cut off Saul's seed when David became king, 1 Samuel 24, 17 through 21. Nevertheless, Saul still sought to kill David. Reason has no place in the mind of an angry, wrathful, and unsaved man. Ecclesiastes 7, 9, anger resteth in the bosom of fools. 1 Samuel 26, 2, then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David. Saul had no peace as long as David lived. David was, in Saul's mind, a threat to his throne. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. What a fateful description of a world of sinners without Christ, and each, like Saul, turned to his own way. The Lord Jesus said, For what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world, 
and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Saul had been an unknown Benjamite and the seeker of his father's asses. But now by the providence of God, he is king of Israel, the people of Jehovah God. Is this not the fantasy of multitudes to be a king? And was not this the gracious hand of God toward Saul? And should not this grace have humbled Saul? After all, what did he have that he had not received? 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Earlier, Samuel had reminded Saul of this. 1 Samuel 15, 17. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? How significant the little word when. There was a season in Saul's life when he was humble, a time when he recognized his lowly position. But worldly success infected his character like a deadly virus. And just as dead flies caused the perfumer's oil to send forth a stinking savor, so did the folly of arrogance bring an all-pervasive stench to Saul's life. Ecclesiastes 10.1. But like the troubled and restless sea, sinful Saul finds no security in his kingship and no peace within his wicked soul. And though scripture witnesses a thousand times over that peace for the soul is only in God, the legion of humanity continue to pursue and grasp for this world's trinkets as if they were true treasure indeed. Christ alone is the treasure for the soul, and he is the only object worthy for the heart. Amen. As the hymn writer expressed it, Whom have we, Lord, but thee, soul thirst to satisfy? Exhaustless spring, the water's free, all other streams are dry. And another hymn, Hast thou heard him, seen him, known him? Is not thine a captured heart? Chief among ten thousand own him. Joyful choose the better part. And still again, peace with God for Christ in heaven. Object is of faith to me. Peace with God. The Lord is risen. Righteousness now counts me free. Hallelujah. How good for the soul to breathe deeply the pure air of heaven where the redeemed of all ages cry, worthy is the Lamb. Amen. But as long as we walk in this world, we are exhorted by the Lord Jesus to exercise caution. Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In the integrity of David's heart, as a harmless dove, he wanted to believe Saul would no longer pursue him. But as a wise serpent, David understood that the wolves of this world are never to be fully trusted. A believer then is to maintain an attitude of gentleness, love, and compassion towards all men. Such an attitude will keep the heart and mind free from a cynical viewpoint of humanity. And this, of course, is more easily said than done especially if you have experienced betrayal or injustice. But David had experienced both betrayal and injustice at the hand of Saul. And still he sent the spies in hope that there was a mistake as to Saul's renewed pursuit of him. In short, a believer must guard against cynicism, else he or she risk locking themselves in a fortified castle of distrust and suspicion. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. A couple other scriptures come to mind. Romans 16, 19. I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Proverbs 4, 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen. 
1 Samuel 26, 5 through 7, And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zeruiah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. When Israel camped in the wilderness, the tabernacle was always in the midst. The tabernacle represented God's presence with them. This is always God's place amongst his people. As is often remembered, the Lord Jesus said, For where two or three are gathered together under my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18, 20. But now in David, we see Christ rejected and outside Saul's camp. There is no room for Christ in the world of men. And Christ rejected means man supplanting his place. So Saul lay in the trench and the people pitched round about him. Verse 5. In a soon coming day, the world will worship the devil and his puppet. It will be the devil's man in the midst, Revelation 13, 4. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? At the cross, this sinful world cried, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! John 19, 15. And shortly, this sinful world will cry, Who is like unto the beast? As the Lord Jesus proclaimed, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. John 5, 43. And this beast of a man who shall come in his own name shall stand up against the prince of princes, the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel 8, 25. But his judgment will be certain and swift. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And only then will it be said, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Isaiah 32.1 Hallelujah. That king is the Lord Jesus. But until that glorious day, the believer lives in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.9. It is the kingdom of our rejected king, who himself has taken his rightful place in glory. And it is our privilege to share in his rejection while we patiently wait for him to call us away to our home in heaven. Amen. And we see this kingdom and patience expressed in David's life. Though David is the anointed king, still he waits upon God to establish his kingdom. 1 Samuel 26, 8 through 12. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. David will not allow Abishai to raise his hand against Saul. It is no doubt fresh in David's mind how God had defended him with Nabal. Abigail had admonished David never to let personal offense move him to revenge. And by God's grace, David had heeded Abigail's counsel. Now David applies the lesson learned to his dealings with Saul. How important. It is to put God's lessons into practice in our lives. 
A walk with God is not theoretical, but it is to be intensely practical. James 1, 22 through 24. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 12, so David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster and they got them away and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awakened for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. This is quite interesting. A deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. As another has said, how easily can God weaken the strongest, befool the wisest and baffle the most watchful? Let all his friends therefore trust him and all his enemies fear him. David took Saul's spear and cruise of water. The spear was Saul's weapon and spiritually speaks of the sword of God's word. But as is the case with many professing believers, there is a dullness to the word. But this dullness develops over time. It is a process of decay. Just like a muscle weakens with atrophy, from lack of exercise, the spiritual life weakens with spiritual atrophy from lack of lifting the book. And we don't mean carrying the book. For instance, carrying the Bible to a church meeting. No, lifting the Bible in a daily quiet time with the Lord. So Saul lost his spear because of dullness of mind. And a professing believer who is not exercising with the word of God will be weaponless and in grave spiritual danger. The powers of darkness are continually waging a most vicious warfare against those that name the name of Christ. And the fact that Saul had missed three times when throwing his spear at David and once at Jonathan is a testimony to his lack of experience and ability how every believer needs exercise with the Word of God in order to be both an unashamed worker and warrior, 2 Timothy 2.15. But David also took Saul's cruise of water. Again, water is a familiar symbol of the Word of God. It is by water and the Spirit, by the living Word of God, that we are born again, John 3.5, 1 Peter 1.23. And it is by the water of the Word that we are sanctified, Ephesians 5, 26. And it is by the water of the word that we are refreshed. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. So any professing believer who through dullness and neglect is not in the enjoyment of the word of God will lose the benefit of its both sanctifying and refreshing power. And the same judgment of God may be their discipline as with Saul's company. A deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Now David, with Saul's spear and cruise of water in hand, the evidence of his clandestine operation of mercy, calls to Abner and challenges him. Abner had slept and not protected the king, and David had opportunity to kill both he and Saul and had not, verses 13 through 16. And with this interaction, Saul is awakened and recognizes David's voice. Verse 17, and Saul knew David's voice and said, is this thy voice, my son, David? And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O King. Once again, this is truly rich with devilish hypocrisy. Saul addresses David as my son. He's brought 3,000 chosen men to kill David. And yet in the dark mind of this deranged king, David is to him, my son. Verse 18, and David said, wherefore doth my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in mine hand? David's response to Saul reminds us of David's greater son, the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus once asked the unbelieving Jews, John 8, 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? They had no answer, for he had no sin. The Lord Jesus lived 33 and a half years in this world and had no sin. And of course, he is the ancient of days who eternally had no sin. 
But the word of God gives ample testimony as to the Lord's sinless manhood. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, who knew no sin. Christ never sinned, wherefore had no personal knowledge of sin. Hebrews 4, 15, he was without sin or sin apart. Christ had no sin nature. He was intrinsically holy. 1 Peter 2, 21, who did no sin. Christ never committed sin. 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. The principle of sin and lawlessness was never present in him. And because of his sinlessness, he is peerless and is alone qualified for his sacrificial death for sin and sinners. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 19, the lamb without blemish and without spot. Once again, from the hymn writer's pen, Lamb of God, when we behold thee, lowly in the manger laid, wandering as a homeless stranger in the world thy hands had made. When we see thee in the garden in thine agony of blood, at thy grace we are confounded, holy, spotless Lamb of God. When we see thee as the victim, nailed to the accursed tree for our guilt and folly stricken, all our judgment borne by thee, Lord, we own with hearts adoring, Thou hast washed us in thy blood. Glory, glory everlasting be to thee, thou Lamb of God. Amen. Saul is moved by David's passionate plea in verses 18 through 20, at least emotionally moved, for Saul's character has become fixed in unbelief. Verse 21, Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in th thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Finally, we have truth from Saul. Though it may be a feigned confession, it is nevertheless truth. First, I have sinned. Then, I have played the fool and finally have erred exceedingly. Saul confessed that he had sinned, true enough, and this is the third time the Word of God witnesses to that confession, 1 Samuel 15, 24, and verse 30. We would like to believe the old adage applies to Saul, the third time's the charm. But there is no charm in Saul's persistent unbelief. He needs more than luck. He needs genuine repentance. But Saul is not the only hypocrite or mask wearer as the original word meant, to voice these words, I have sinned. Pharaoh, Balaam, Achan, and Judas all confessed they had sinned too. There was a British rock group in the 1970s and 80s called Bad Company. I don't know where the group got the idea for their name, but it certainly fits Saul, Pharaoh, Balaam, Achan, and Judas well. All five of these calloused unbelievers sought mercy for their sin. But repentance toward God is not regarding a sin, but a whole life of sin. However, for such absolute and naked exposure, none of these men were willing to unmask. Next, Saul proclaimed, I have played the fool. I wonder how many unspoken amens heaven heard at that mo moment. There is most probably no safe person that does not have a I have played the fool moment of which they are now ashamed. I certainly do. Too many. I'm just glad I never got into the habit of keeping a diary. But Saul played the fool not on occasion, but as his course of life. Perhaps David had Saul in mind at this very moment, too, when he penned Psalm 14. 14.1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And finally, Saul confessed, I have erred exceedingly. But neither Saul nor any of us could possibly understand just how exceedingly we have erred. Light years are far, far too short a distance to describe how exceedingly far our sins have separated us from the holy God of heaven. But God be praised, 
the exceeding heir of our ways has been answered at the cross of Calvary. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. By nature and by practice far. How very far from God. Yet now by grace brought nigh to him through faith in Jesus' blood. Amen. Verse 25, Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things, and also thou shalt prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. It must have been quite a scene for Saul's army of 3,000 chosen men of Israel to witness this exchange between their king and commander and David. David was public enemy number one. It was David that they were pledged to track and kill. And now their king and commander publicly praised David. When the Lord Jesus walked here below, the crowds often sought him. They gathered to him. They offered him their praises. But when the voices of the chief priests and Pharisees threatened to put them out of the synagogue, anyone that confessed him, their praises became faint and evaporated like a morning dew. John 9, 22 and John 12, 42 and 43. And yes, Saul, David shall do great things and he shall prevail. But there is another of whom David is but a shadow. And the great things that he shall do, no man has ever done. Matthew 12, 5, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have the gospel preached to them. John 9, 32, since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? And yet far, far greater still, this one, the Lord Jesus, taketh away the sin of the world for he is the lamb of god john 129 amen and amen so david went on his way and saul returned to his place and david's way of faith and saul's place of unbelief represent two eternities that shall never meet our god and our father we think of lost souls around us, as we all once were. May we have compassion upon those that are lost and needing salvation. You had compassion upon us. We pray, blessed God and Father, that we who are believers would be lifting up the Bible, that we would be opening the Word of God every day and fellowshipping with Thee, that we might be strong and ready for battle and to do the work that you've called us to do. We thank thee, blessed God and Father, for thy word. We pray it will be a, a living word to us, and that you would change us in the sanctifying power of the word of God by thy spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.